We invite you to take your seats. In about two minutes, we will begin adoring and worshiping our Lord together. Thank you. Good morning, church. Happy Sabbath. It is so good to be back in the house of the Lord this morning. Uh, for myself, it has been a while. Um, for those of you that don't know, my wife and I had our second child, um, and she has been a handful, and we have been enjoying church uh, from our living room streaming. Uh, I was talking to the, the worship team uh, right before we came out here saying, I cannot wait to hear the music of this church in in person live. I don't I don't feel like my Samsung TV really does it justice. So I'm very excited to be here. Um, I will also want to welcome those of you who are streaming at home because it is so great to be able to connect with this community even when we are unable to leave our homes. Um, so it's just been really really great for that. Um, that leads me into my first announcement. Um, we have a table with flowers back in the back in the lobby, and those flowers are designated to go to some of our members who are unable to join us at church, for whatever reason that is. Our homebound members. Um, we would like to extend an offer for those of you who are able, who are willing, who feel the Holy Spirit talking to you this morning. If you are able to take some of those flowers to those members, we would be extremely grateful. Um, at the end of church today, as you leave, there, there are cards with the names and the contact information and the addresses for, for those members, um, and there will also be several people standing back there to help you if you have questions or if you need um, information about that. Um, a couple other things that I'd like to bring to your attention for announcements today. Um, I don't know if you guys noticed, but our church community is growing, and it is, it is just amazing to see the amount of people who have been joining our community, uh, who have been testing out our community. Um, we love the fact that you have found Knoxville first, and we hope that you do choose to make it your continual home for worship. Um, there's a first reading for um, a transfer. Mark Jocelyn. Mark, are you here this morning? If you are, just give us a quick wave. Okay. Um, but we want to welcome the first reading for Mark Jocelyn. He's going to be transferring from the Berrien Springs Pioneer Memorial Church. Um, and then there's also a first reading, um, a, tra a family transferring from Knoxville first, and that's Charles, Marcia, Zion, and Eden, and they will be transferring to the College Hill SDA Church. A few other announcements. Um, it is Easter weekend, and we are very excited to begin celebrating um, all that that means Tomorrow morning, I would like to point out that we are also having a, um, I'm going to call it a get-together, but it's really kind of like a dressed-up potluck in disguise, which is pretty great. We're going to have a quick little brunch at 9 
There's going to be music. There's going to be sharing. Um, and we encourage all of those that want to come and attend, it's going to be held over in our gymnasium, to bring something along with you to share as well, whether that's a casserole or um, some fruit, whatever it is you guys want to bring. Um, we are going to be having a, um, a potluck worship Easter morning service there tomorrow morning. That's Sunday, March 31st at 9 a.m. Um, Pastor Leon wanted me to mention that Youth Volleyball Night is going to be taking place April 6th in our gym from 8 to 9 p.m. The age group there is from 13 to 18. If you have questions, go ahead and please contact Pastor Lee and himself. Um, last but not least, um, and this kind of brings me back to our, uh, our growing church and our growing community, um, we have very limited parking spaces available. Um, and so if you are an able-bodied member of this community, we highly encourage you to park down at the, at the lower level parking lot, which allows those of our members who um, may have a harder time being able to get around, whether that's um, they're using a walker or maybe just taking the stairs is just a little bit too much. We want to make sure that the parking spaces that are closest to the front door, the ones right down here and over here by the gym, are reserved for those um, those members who need to be a little bit closer to our building. Um, growth is exciting, but we want to make sure we take care of everybody, and we really appreciate you guys understanding. Um, I want to share a quick message with you. I've been thinking about... Um, I've been thinking about the resurrection weekend all week in preparation for being up here, and I wanted to read a quick little excerpt from uh, the Messiah. And uh, this is on page uh, 413. It's chapter 80. The title of the chapter is called Jesus Rests. And I just wanted to share something with you uh, this morning. It was an unforgettable Sabbath for the disciples, the priests and leaders and the people of Jerusalem. The Passover was observed as it had been for centuries, while the one it pointed to lay in Joseph's tomb. The courts of the temple were filled with people. The high priest was there in, their, in his fine robe, and other priests performed their duties. But there was a sense of strangeness to everything. The people were not aware that Jesus' death had fulfilled the prophecies and the symbols of the Passover service, but they had conflicting feelings as they witnessed the service this time. The most holy place, the heart of the temple that only the high priests had ever seen, was now open to be seen by anyone. No longer considered a holy place by God, its curtain had been ripped from top to bottom. This worried the priests greatly, and they were sure that something terrible was going to happen. During these hours between the crucifixion and the resurrection, many sleepless people studied the prophecies. Some searched for evidence that Jesus was not who he claimed to be. Others searched for proof that he was the Messiah. Regardless of where they started, they all arrived at the same conclusion. The one who had been crucified was the savior of the world. Many of them never again celebrated Passover. Even among the priests, many searched the prophecies, and after his resurrection, they followed Jesus as the son of God. I wanted to share this because I feel like this little excerpt kind of reminds me a little bit of where we currently are today. We're kind of waiting for Jesus to come for that second coming. We were able, we've been able to know and we've been privy to the information to see who Jesus was, what he did in his life, and we know for a fact who he is and who he is to us and what his death and resurrection meant to us, but we're waiting for him to come again. And so we're kind of in that middle ground, that time of we're still living our life, we're still here, but we're still waiting. And I don't know about you, it's hard to wait. I've got a couple, uh, a couple girls that just have zero patients that are living in my house, and I keep telling them, that, oh, it's so hard to wait, isn't it? It's so hard to wait, but man, it is hard to wait. And um, I, cannot, uh, I cannot wait until Jesus comes again. I'm very excited about it. Once you uh, bow your heads and um, let's go ahead and invite Jesus into this service with us here this morning. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for this, this Sabbath, for this day, for this day of rest, for this church and this church community. And I pray as we start this special Easter service this morning that you fill this room, this church, with your presence. Help us to remove the distractions from our minds, clear our hearts and our minds so that we can be fully present here in this room and make as much room as possible for the words that you are going to put on our heart. I pray as we lift you up in song and we worship you this morning that you, you, you elevate us to your throne room so that we can be as close to you as possible. Fill us with your Holy Spirit, Lord, 
And uh, I pray that the words that you've placed on Pastor Matthew's heart this morning for, um, for this sermon, that you allow room there to touch our hearts and our minds. We love you so much. Amen. Good morning, church family. Uh, welcome. And uh, we are excited that we are able to do a few more songs with you guys today to help celebrate Easter and just praise God and thank Him for the sacrifice that He made for us. And so we just pray that you guys sing loud with us, um, that these prayers become prayers of your heart, and just let the Holy Spirit fill the room. saints are up there just singing with all of their heart, holy, holy is the Lord.
It's great to feel the presence of the Lord when you're worshiping and to connect that to answered prayer. Ah, what a blessing. Thank you very much, music team, worship, and all of you out there. You sounded lovely. It is now time for 
church offering. Today's offering is going to go towards church budget. Um, just a, a reminder, a loose offering is also going to go to the church operating budget. And um, Lord, it is just for me standing here and seeing the generosity on paper. If you look in your bulletin, you'll see the um, we keep a tally of church through giving through the date. And you'll see how much is collected for Worthy Student Fund, how much is collected for church budget, um, what we've projected, and then how much we've been able to gain. And I think since I have been here at Knoxville First, we have never once not been able to help someone in need. We haven't been, never been able to not hit a budget determination of what it is we tried to, tried to achieve. And we've always been able to come through with the needs of our church, our church meeting, our congregation. I think that is just a huge testament to the spirit moving in your generosity. So I want to, I just, I'm very grateful for you all in your giving. A quick reminder about giving, you can either um, give here, there's church, uh, there's little envelopes uh, in your church pews, the church backs in front of you. Um, we no longer have the giving box out in the lobby. So the other way is you can uh, follow the QR code um, that's going to be uh, posted up and you can uh, donate online. Uh, deacons, you please stand. Heavenly Father, as we receive these financial donations in giving, I'm just so thankful for your promise to always come through and provide for us. I want to thank you so much for providing for each one of the families and the individuals as represented here in our community, for always taking care of our needs even before we know that they're arising. And I also want to thank you so much for the faithfulness of this community to give back generously to others who may be in need. Um, bless these offerings. We love you in your name, amen. Children's Story is up next, one of our favorite times of our church service where kids get to leave their seats, they can get a little bit of that energy out, they can participate, they can grab some of these baskets up here in the front and um, collect some donations that goes towards uh, KS Fund. And there's a slight change in our, um, our program here. Um, Cassia Owen is not scheduled to teach this, um, making a quick little change. The man, the myth, the legend, Jeff White is going to be doing our story this morning.
Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls. My wife and I were sitting on the front porch this morning talking about our favorite seasons because it was beautiful this morning. I hope you had some time to spend out in the grass. And my number one season is fall. I love the fall, the cozy, the fires, but spring is a very close second. And we love springtime. I love it because I get to mow and nobody can bother me while I'm mowing. We get to run around barefoot in the grass, baby chickens, all kinds of fun stuff happens in spring. And we know summer's right around the corner and we have lots of trees growing and blossoming and flowers outside. But there's one problem with being barefoot out in the grass when there's lots of flowers about. There's these little things called bees, right? You ever seen them? You ever stepped on a bee? It's not so much fun. When I was little, my father kept honeybees up in Maryland. And one day I was running around barefoot and I stepped on a bee. And what did it do to me? It stung me on the foot. And it hurt. And my dad gave me Benadryl and said, be careful of the bees. Watch where you go. Be attentive and stay away from the beehive. What do you think I did? I went to check out the beehive. Right? When dad tells you not to do something, you got to go check it out. And I went over to the beehive and I stood in front and I watched the bees fly out and fly back in. And I wanted to get a better perspective. So I got down on the level of the beehive hole and I stuck my face up nice and close. Do you think the bees really enjoyed a giant coming in to look in their beehive? Nope. In fact, a bunch of bees came out to say hi but not with their face. They did it with their tush, and they stung me right in the face. I looked like a different kid for about a week. I couldn't see for two days. I had to just sit in my bed, couldn't watch cartoons or nothing. And my brothers just made fun of me. I deserved it. Well, after a couple of weeks, I decided, you know, I want to go and apologize to the bees. I want to be their best friend. I'm a slow learner, apparently. And, you know, when you think bees, what is a great, sweet thing we think about when we hear bees? Honey! Bees must love honey. I'm going to give them a gift from last year's harvest of honey. So I took a nice big old honey bear, and I went outside to the beehive, and I just started smearing it all over the beehive thinking, man, they're going to be my best friends. They weren't. Those bees had a memory, a memory of a giant who stuck his face in the beehive hole, and they came out to say hi, not with their face, with their butts. And they stung me all over my face again. My parents have a picture of this. I didn't bring it because I wasn't quite prepared. I got stung Of course, my father said, you should probably stay away from the beehive and the honey and everything else and just stay inside for a while. And I asked my highly intelligent father, Dad, why don't the bees want to be my friend? I'm trying to be nice to them. He said, well, first off, are you a bee? I said, no. I said, do you speak like a bee? "Mm, Nope. Do you dance like a bee dances to communicate? No. Do you live in a beehive? I don't fit, so no. He said, the only way that you could be a friend of a bee and really know and understand and want to communicate that you are harmless, that you want to be their friend is, you would have to be a bee. Can I be a bee? No. I'm a little too big. I can't fly. I don't have a stinger. But it made me stop and think, now that I'm older, that was very, very wise and sage advice. As we're thinking about the Easter holiday and the season that we have of thinking about that great sacrifice, Jesus came to this earth. He came to become a bee, a human bee, because he wanted to show and talk and love and be with us. And unfortunately, some of us didn't do such a good job with that, and we stung him. We hurt him. And when we make bad choices, we sting him again. And I know as a 44-year-old perfect guy, I still sting Jesus, and that makes me sad. And I remember Pastor Pate a number of years ago, probably before y'all were born, He said, what's the greatest thing about heaven? And we started talking about that in the service a little bit. And he said, a lot of times it's we think, I can fly with the angels. I can go to a different planet. I can pet a lion. And he said, the best thing about heaven is we'll never hurt Jesus again. 
So let's think about that today. And I want to share my verse with you that comes from the message. And it's coming from the end of Hebrews 2. It says it's obvious, of course, that he didn't go to all of this trouble for the angels. It was for people like us, the children of Abraham. That's why he had to enter into every detail of human life. Then when he came before God as our high priest to get rid of our sin, our stings, he would have already experienced it all himself, all of the pain, all of the bee stings, all of the testing, and would be able to help where he was needed. Jesus saves our souls. So let's keep our stingers tucked away, use them on the devil, and let Jesus live in our life. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, thank you for honeybees. They offer us a sweet treat, but also, Lord, there can be a sting when we're not nice. And so, Lord, may we be something that is sweet. May we be that honey in your mouth. But we can't do it. We have to have Jesus inside of us. So we pray for the Holy Spirit's presence today. And thank you so much for the lesson of Easter. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, boys and girls, have a wonderful Sabbath. Kevin, uh, forgot we're doing morning prayer. <laughs> Good morning, church. Happy Sabbath to each of you. It is now time in our service to um, gather together in prayer and um, come before the throne of grace and just saying thank you to the Lord for the different blessings he's bestowed upon us. Maybe you have a special prayer request and that's heavy on your heart. It's tradition here at our church in Knoxville first for you to come forward if you'd like. If not, I encourage you to kneel where you are at as we... Uh, Approach the throne of grace. Let us pray. Our Father in heaven, we praise you this morning for this Sabbath day. Lord, we are grateful that you've set aside for us from the beginning of the world a day for us to deeper, deeply connect with you. And so, Lord, we just come to you on this just beautiful spring Sabbath day just to say thank you for being our God, for being our creator, for being our Father, and through Jesus Christ being our Redeemer. Lord, we have so much to praise you, so many blessings that you've bestowed upon our lives and so, Lord, I just ask that you bring those things to the forefront of our minds. It's so easy, God, to complain, to just talk about the burdens that we carry without recognizing the goodness and your faithfulness each and every day. And, Lord, on a day like today where we are pausing to reflect and just be more meditatively focused on the price your son paid to save us on Calvary, on the cross, Lord, we say thank you for the plan of salvation. Lord, we praise you for Jesus, for going through what he went through on a weekend very similar to this 2,000 years ago for our behalf. Jesus, we just praise you. And we ask that we, you help us to be faithful and to surrender our lives to you. But Lord, you, you also encourage us to bring those burdens before you to cast our cares upon you because you care for us. And so, Lord, I just pray that the requests and the things that weigh heavy on our hearts, that we lay them down at your feet. And in exchange, Father, may you give us a peace that surpasses understanding. May you give us a joy that gives us strength and a hope that helps us to continually look unto you. 
Lord, we pray for those in our faith community who are struggling with illness, that are struggling with health challenges. Lord, we think of Goldine, and we pray that you be with her. We, we think of others um, that have been going through just difficulties, whether it's financial, whether it's relational. Father, may you draw close to them today. And Lord, you know the burdens and the requests that we keep silent. Those things that just you and I know. Lord, in this moment, may we just lay those things down at your feet just in this silent few seconds. Jesus, we thank you for being our advocate. We thank you because your sacrifice tore the veil in two, and now we can boldly come before the throne of our Heavenly Father. That as our mediator, we can go directly to our Creator. And so, Jesus, we just thank you for this great sacrifice. We thank you for hearing our prayers, and we just ask that you continue to go with us throughout this day and throughout the rest of this week. May the praise and the worship that we bring before you being offering that is acceptable in your sight. We thank you, Lord, for hearing our prayers, for giving us for our sins, for we ask these things in your holy and precious name. Amen.
Amen. Thank you for that wonderful music. I'll be doing the scripture reading today from Luke 23. It's verse 44 through 46. I'll be reading New King James. Now, it was about the sixth hour, and there was darkness over all the earth until the ninth hour. Then the sun was darkened, and the veil of the temple was torn in two. And when Jesus had cried out with a loud voice, he said, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. Having said this, he breathed his last. May the Lord add a blessing to the reading of his word. Amen. Good morning and happy Sabbath, church. Today is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Amen. Amen. Cannot think of a more beautiful spring day for us as we are here celebrating the good news of our risen Savior. It is a joy to be with you all. I just extend a warm welcome to each and every one of you. If you're here as a guest and a visitor, thank you for being with us this morning. If you are looking for a place to call home, we would encourage you to consider joining our family here at Knoxville First. Thank you to our online viewers for being here with us as well. Your presence is sensed, and we're just grateful for you being here. Um, It has been a beautiful and full weekend already. I just want to just give a shout out to the praise team. Thank you for leading us in worship. It was uh, a little slice and foretaste of heaven. Amen? Amen. And uh, to, to Darlene and the social committee and those involved with the Agape Feast last night, thank you once again for that, for the decorations. I don't know if you came in and you noticed something in the foyer. Did anyone see anything different in the foyer? That is not just for mere decoration, um, but for you and your family, maybe on their way out to stop, get a photo of, of, uh, of you guys. I know you, you came looking sharp on this Sabbath morning, and um, we just want to just uh, maybe provide a little memento for you all as we remember our risen Savior. Yesterday, as I announced last Sabbath, I had an opportunity to participate in an ecumenical prayer service at the Sacred Hearts Cathedral. And um, I threw out kind of a blanket invitation for people to come um, because it would mean a lot for me to be in a strange place but see familiar faces. And several of you did. And so just thank you for coming and supporting. I was blessed by the service. I believe those who attended were blessed. And I was just reminded that we have brothers and sisters in the faith and that God's family is a large family. And it was, uh, it was a joy to be able to participate in that. Um, but in case you missed it, it is all good because today's sermon is just the fuller version of that devotional thought. They, uh, they only gave us five minutes and that's not enough time for a preacher. And so <laughs> I, uh, I told some of our members that were there, I said, get ready because Sabbath morning will be round two of what we heard just a little bit fuller. And so today's message for the time that is ours, I just want to talk to you for a moment under the title, Into Your Hands. Bow your heads with me as we pray. Our Father in heaven, once again, we just come before your presence and just praise you and worship you for the miracle that is Calvary. Lord, we are just grateful this morning that through Jesus, every person here, every person watching online has the opportunity of eternal life through Jesus Christ. And Lord, in case we have not yet made that decision, may today be the day of salvation. May today, Lord, be the day that we choose you that we choose to go all in, that we surrender ourselves, and today be the day that we become more devoted followers of Jesus. Because Jesus, you did for us what we could not do for ourselves. So in this moment, 
as we reflect on your great sacrifice, may your Holy Spirit move in our lives so that we can hear your voice speaking to us. May you silence any distractions around us or within us so that we can be attuned to what you have to say. Lord, we just invite your presence here once again. And it is my prayer that the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart may be pleasing and acceptable in your sight, my Lord, my rock, and my redeemer. We thank you, Jesus, for all these things and more, for we pray them in your holy and precious name. Let all of God's people say, Amen. Amen. And amen, and amen. If you have your Bibles with me, I invite you to turn to the Gospel of Luke, the 23rd chapter. Luke 23. Thank you, Alex, for reading our Scripture reading. But I've, I've been debating on whether or not looking at this, this story in a larger context, and I thought, well, you're in church, Matt, we can read the Bible. And so we're going to do that. We're going to begin in verse 26, go all the way down to verse 46. Luke 23, beginning in verse 26, moving all the way down to verse 46. When you're there at church, give me an amen. Amen. I'm reading from the New Living Translation, but feel free to follow along whatever version and translation you have. Luke 23, beginning in verse 26. Before we read this, I just encourage you just to do what you can to just imagine and just place yourself in this story. This is a familiar story. We, we know the events that are about to take place, but I just pray that as we read God's Word right now that they take a fresh and deeper meaning. Luke 23, beginning in verse 26. Hear the Word of the Lord. As they led Jesus away, a man named Simon, who was from Cyrene, happened to be coming in from the countryside. The soldier seized him and put the cross on him and made him carry it behind Jesus. A large crowd tra- trailed behind, including many grief-stricken women. But Jesus turned and said to them, Daughters of Jerusalem, don't weep for me, but weep for yourselves and for your children. For the days are coming when they will say, Fortunate indeed are the women who are childless, the wombs that have not borne a child, and the breasts that have, not, that have never nursed. People will beg the mountains, fall on us, and plead with the hills, bury us. But if these things are done when the tree is green... What will happen when it is dry? Two others, both criminals, were let out to be executed with him. And when they came to the place called the skull, they nailed him to the cross. And the criminals were also crucified, one on his right and one on his left. And Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they don't know what they're doing. And the soldiers gambled with his clothing by throwing dice. And the crowd watched and the leaders scoffed. He saved others, they said. Let him save himself if he really is God's Messiah, the Chosen One. The soldiers mocked him too. By offering him a drink of sour wine, they called out to him, If you are the King of the Jews, save yourself. A sign was fastened above him with those words, This is the King of the Jews. And one of the criminals hanging beside him scoffed. So you're the Messiah, are you? Prove it by saving yourself and us too while you're at it. But the other criminal protested. Don't you fear God even when you've been sentenced to die? We deserve to die for our crimes, but this man hasn't done anything wrong. Then he said, Jesus... Remember me when you come into your kingdom. Verse 43, And Jesus replied, I assure you today, you will be with me in paradise. By this time, it was about noon, and darkness fell across the whole land until three o'clock. The light from the sun was gone, and suddenly the curtain in the sanctuary of the temple was torn down the middle. Then Jesus shouted, Father, Into your hands I entrust my spirit. And with those words, he breathed 
His last. Verse 46 once more. Then Jesus shouted, Father, I entrust my spirit into your hands. And with those words, he breathed his last. Long gone are the scenes of the upper room in Gethsemane. For in rapid succession, one event after the next has unfolded, and now Christ is seen being placed and hung on a cross on that hill called Calvary. And what simultaneously felt like the longest and shortest day, the Messiah is beginning to breathe His last breath. For after hours of suffering under the heartbreak of false accusations, betrayal, abandonment, crowds cheering for His execution, the cruel conclusion to that Friday is swiftly approaching. The agony of abusive mocking. The crown of thorns. The flesh-ripping flogging. His hands and feet being nailed. The struggle for every breath and the shame of being uh, hung naked for a world to see are soon reaching its intended outcome. Death is only seconds away. And although we know when we call these events to have happened on a Good Friday, friends, there is nothing peaceful or serene about the, this moment. And still, with dark clouds, with a thick darkness and in, 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 in density that engulfs an entire city, Christ is able to find the strength to raise His head for one last time and proclaim in a loud voice these words, Father, into Your hands I commit My Spirit. These are the final words of Jesus. Words in which only Luke records. For in Matthew and Mark, it just simply says that Jesus uttered a loud cry and He breathed His last. Yet Luke captures these culminating words as evidence that our suffering Savior has finished, uh, has finished the work, has reached the finish line of His calling and purpose. For in echoing those words, Jesus is giving a sense of a familiarity to those that were present at Calvary that day. Because you see, church, as He often did throughout His life and ministry, when Christ speaks, He quotes Scripture. And in those words, for one last time with His dying breath, the Savior is seen quoting the psalmist in Psalm 31. If you were to look at Psalm 31... You would find these words penned there. Psalm 31 was written by King David and scholars believe that it was most likely written while he was on the run from King Saul. David is being persecuted. And the words of Psalm 31 was his profession and prayer of his cheerful confidence that God was this place of safety in present troubles. Are you with me this morning? David in Psalm 31 has a confidence that although he is praying for the Lord's deliverance, although he is praying for the Lord's protection, he is remaining trusting and hoping that God will be faithful. Some scholars have actually suggested that Psalm 31 was a psalm that was sung as an evening prayer in many Jewish homes. It was offered up as the final song before a, a family would lay down to sleep because they were trusting that God would care for His people through the darkness of night. In Psalm 31, verses 1-5, through 5, it says, In You, Lord, I have taken refuge. Let me never be put to shame. Deliver me in Your righteousness. Turn Your ear to me. Come quickly to my rescue. Be my rock of refuge, my strong fortress to save me. And since You are my rock and refuge, for the sake of Your name, lead and guide me. Keep me free from the trap that is set for me. For You are my refuge. And then in verse 5, it says, into your hands I commit my spirit. Deliver me, 
my Lord, my faithful God. And despite the circumstances that were surrounding David, despite the distress that he was in by being persecuted by a very powerful figure, David is proclaiming repeatedly throughout this psalm that his soul, that his life, will always be safe when he places it in the hands of God. Though his foes may win a temporary victory, David believed that God will justify the righteous. That even though he were to die, David trusted that the Lord would vindicate his life. Later on in this psalm, in verse 14 and 15, he says, But I am trusting you, O Lord, saying you are my God, for my future is in your hands. And isn't it precisely this meaning, beloved, that Jesus is invoking as he is hanging on the cross and crying out for one last time. What Jesus is crying out as he quotes the psalmist is him by simply saying, my life is in the hands of the Father. Final words are important, aren't they? They're important because they represent our last will and testament. And so last words are typically chosen with a careful precision. And in Jesus' last words, there is no exception. There is no difference. Because by quoting the psalmist, Christ is imparting two final thoughts as He is dying. Thoughts that I believe that can help strengthen our faith and our hope today. The first is that as Jesus cries out, Father, into Your hands I commit My Spirit, what He is showing you and I and everyone who was there that day is that Jesus died as He lived. And that was by trusting His life with the Father. Jesus died as He lived. By trusting the Father. When you read the Gospels, it is extremely clear that Jesus throughout His entirety of life was fully committed and dependent on God. From His very first breath to His last, Christ is demonstrating with His life a obedient faith to the Father. In John 8, verse 29, Christ says, And He who set Me is with Me. The Father has not left Me alone, for I always do those things that please Him. Church, it was only by trusting in the Father could Jesus fulfill the plan of salvation. It was only by trusting in the Father was Jesus able to carry the weight of the world's sin and become the advocate that you and I so desperately need. Christ in that moment could not see beyond the cross. And so with His dying breath, what He is saying is, Lord, I don't know what's about to happen, but in Your hands I commit my spirit. And as we think about Jesus' example, I believe that you and I are reminded today that the only way we can live life, the only way that we can live the abundant life that Jesus offers us is by trusting our Heavenly Father. Amen? Friends, I believe that the last words of Jesus seize the essence of what the Gospel is all about. Trust. Trust. Through the valleys of cancer diagnosis, of job loss, of broken relationships, the followers of Jesus are reminded that my life is sustained by trusting in the Father. Likewise, through the mountaintop blessings of new jobs, of answered prayers for our family and our children, for the, for the protection in the midst of accidents, or for the simple blessing of newness of life every day, the followers of Jesus are reminded that they live only by trusting in the Father. So church, may our lives bear the same testimony to that which Jesus' last words gave. We trust our lives into the Father's hands. But the second thought I believe that Jesus' words reveal to us is that Christ dies 
so that those who trust in Him may live. Hallelujah. Christ dies so that those who trust in Him may live. In the very first chapter of the book, Desire of Ages, page 25, there's this quotation that reads, Christ was treated as we deserve, that we might be treated as He deserves. He was condemned for our sins in which He had no share so that we might be justified in His righteousness that we have no share. He suffered the death which was ours that we might receive the life that was His. With His stripes, we are healed. Did you catch that, beloved? We had no share in the righteousness and the glory that is prepared for Jesus. Yet because He died for us, we get to participate in that. Jesus had no right to experience the condemnation of sin because that belonged to us. He was a perfect man. But because He loved us so much, He was willing to die for our behalf and share in that agony. So church, let me just slow it down for you just real simply and real quick. Jesus died for you. Jesus died for you. Jesus died for me. He died for each and every one of us so that we, when we place our trust in Him, may have eternal life. He's, he's seen in John chapter 11 talking to Martha and Mary as they're mourning the loss of their brother Lazarus. And Jesus makes this exclamation that we often quote in funeral or memorial services where He says, I am the resurrection and the life. Jesus died for you. Jesus died for me. That was the purpose of Calvary Church. The purpose was to rescue mankind from the bondage of sin. And although today we celebrate that the story of Calvary doesn't just end with the crucifixion, I'm praying that we don't let this moment pass. Because when we just get to Sunday... And we forget about the agony and the suffering that our Savior went through. I fear that we don't accept the fullness of life that He is offering us today. Christ dies so that those who trust in Him may live. Jesus suffered the death that was ours so that we might receive the life that was His. So beloved, as we consider Jesus' example on the cross, I ask you, have you placed your hand or placed your life into the Father's hands? Have you surrendered your whole being in faithful trust to God? Have you committed yourself to following Jesus the same way that He was committed to carrying your cross? Committed like Jesus was to giving you the opportunity for eternal life. Today, the Bible says in 2 Corinthians 6, 1, is the day of salvation. So church, my appeal to you this morning is to choose the one who died in your place. To choose the one who says, I stand at the door and knock. And if you let me in, I will come in and I will dine with you as one who dines with friends. Beloved, don't delay. Don't put off today. Don't put off to tomorrow what Christ is offering you today. Here in this moment, as the Holy Spirit has been impressing you throughout this entire service, I simply leave you with two words. Choose Jesus. Because when you choose Jesus, you choose trust over fear. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. You choose hope over despair. You choose life over death. Beloved, I would appeal to you this morning to choose Jesus because for, almost, for close to about 2,000 years ago, Jesus chose you. When prophesying about the coming Messiah, the Old Testament prophet Isaiah writes these words in Isaiah 53, Verse 3 through 5. 
He says he was despised and rejected by mankind. A man of suffering and familiar with pain. Like one from whom people hid their faces. He was despised and we held him in low esteem. Surely he took up our pain and bore our suffering, yet we considered him punished by God, stricken by him and afflicted. But man, I love verse 5, beloved. It says, but he was pierced for our transgression. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him, and by his wounds we are healed. Hallelujah. Beloved, during this Easter weekend, as we celebrate the resurrection, as we give thanks that we serve a risen Savior, may we give thanks also for the wounds that brought us healing. May we give thanks for the punishment that offers us peace. And as we praise Him, and as we worship Him, may we respond to this amazing gift of eternal life by learning from our Savior from in, a, in His last moment proclaiming with his life, may we do the same with ours. Father, today and every day after, into your hands I commit my spirit. Amen? Amen. 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 Beloved, I encourage you to stand with us as we sing our closing hymn, Because He Lives, hymn number 526. pray just a few announcements again tomorrow morning at 9 a.m. We encourage you to come and join us for a sunrise service over at the gym on your way out. Please remember um, the homebound members if you want to grab a plant and take that to them as well as our little wall out there. Take a picture with your family. 
And after I pray, I invite you all to be seated. We have a postlude, and so let's uh, listen to that and those who are prepared for it um, right after we pray. Let us bow our heads and thank the Lord for his son. God, we just again are just so grateful for the gift of eternal life through Jesus, that you sent him to die for us, plural, but also for me, singular, and for each person here today, and for each person watching online, and for every person who may come across this message at some different point, that Lord, you sent Jesus to die for each and every one of us, because you could not fathom eternity without us, those whom you love and created in your image. Lord, in case any of us have not fully accepted you as our Lord and Savior, I pray that in this moment right now in our hearts, we accept Jesus. If someone is feeling impressed for baptism, that they come and they find myself or an elder, we can help them walk towards that. Lord, if someone needs encouragement, may they know that you love them so much. And though the difficulties and the circumstances of life are challenging and, and they're hard, may they know that like Jesus on the cross committed his life to you, may we do the same. Help us to trust in you, our Heavenly Father, each and every day. As we go from this place, Lord, we don't leave your presence, but take it with us wherever we go. And I pray that throughout this week, Lord, we can have divine encounters and share the goodness of our risen Savior and share with them the invitation that you give to each and every one of us. We thank you, Lord, again for this great sacrifice, for this great demonstration of love. May you forgive us for our sins and help us to be faithful until the very end. We can't wait to see you and pray that you come back soon. For this we ask in Christ's holy and precious name. Amen. Amen.